Good day, and welcome here to another one of Ransford's weekly wraps. As usual, we'll cover three topics that uh, basically had news events this week, as well as, uh, as has become tradition, a deeper dive into some of the AI news you know that has come out this week. So, the three stories this week are going to be as follows. Firstly, uh, the US debt ceiling, then uh, the situation in Europe, and finally we're going to do a uh, deep dive into the rate decisions in Africa as well as the latest inflation uh, reading. And in our deep dive, we'll cover some interesting stuff, uh, you know, some big profits being made by NVIDIA. Okay, let's start off with the debt ceiling. Still no resolution as I, as I speak to you right now. Uh, we have maybe a week to possibly two weeks, uh, you know, basically by the first week, end of the first week of June, this should have been resolved or this needs to be resolved. Uh, much later than that, in the U.S. is in serious uh, you know, chance of defaulting. Uh, every time one of these things happens, there's always a call for basically minting a coin. Technically, the Reserve Bank, uh, the U.S. Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve, could mint a gigantic uh, valuation coin, you know, just put a, like a platinum coin and maybe get a, get a value for a trillion dollars, something like that. And that could, in, in theory, like, you know, uh, be added onto the debt and you know, solve some of the debt that the U.S. Uh, is looking at right now. This is considered to be, you know, but outside the scope of what's basically... Um, uh, how almost, almost like, you know, what's acceptable, uh, in terms of uh, what they should be doing. Uh, it's, it's become viewed that this is a, a tradition or a, a, a important leverage of power for the, uh, party out of power in the U.S. Uh, you know, both parties have used this, the Republicans have believed it more, but there's an aggressive, like, you know, leveraging of the power of the, uh, the debt ceiling in order to get, uh, you know, concessions from the ruling party. Uh, the minting of a coin would basically you know, negate this effectively. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, I think that uh, as we get more and more of these things happening, the chance of something like that happening, something where we do have a, um, a workaround around the debt ceiling occurring is becoming more and more likely. Uh, the thing with these kind of things is that, you know, the first couple of times something like this occurs, you know, the debt ceiling debate, there's a whole bunch of like, you know, a worry about it and there's a whole bunch of stress, etc. But over time, people get more and more used to the idea of this debt ceiling debate happening each time. And then they take it closer and closer to the line. Uh, and as they take it closer and closer to the line, eventually the chance of a catastrophic event becoming, you know, uh, or occurring is, you know, much, much higher. And I think that, you know, at some point in time, the whichever party is in power, when they get close enough to that, you know, uh, default event, uh, the printing or the minting of that coin uh, would be a possibility, I think, that would be looked at quite carefully. The next thing we're talking about is what's happening in Europe at the moment. The Germans are in a technical recession. You know, that means two quarters of negative growth. Uh, that is something I think that we had to be expecting. The German economy is based on a couple of things. Uh, one is cheap energy out of uh, Russia, which obviously is ended now, and you know, energy prices are going higher. And then there is the uh, obviously the workforce. Uh, the Germans have a very, very productive, very capable workforce, but unfortunately is aging and they haven't produced many kids, you know, before this point in time. So uh, right now what we are seeing is that the uh, people that were the, well, called the baby boomers, you know, the people that are born after World War II, uh, you know, that was, think about it, that's uh, effectively World War II occurred, uh, you know, 75, 80 years ago, you know, uh, it, it finished off then. And that's the kind of age of these, the first cohort of these baby boomers. Uh, this goes on to about, you know, the, like the early 60s or something. So it's like a 15 year period. So it was a long time. So, but we are, and like the, the majority of the people I think that our baby boys actually have already retired or about to retire right now. That means that yet they have a workforce that's old, that's retired, and they basically don't have replacements coming through because if you have a lot of kids. Now, look, when you have a bunch of people that are in their 40s and 30s and 50s basically uh, working and they haven't had children, they're much more productive. You know, and does anyone with their family knows that uh, if you have children, they're going to take time away from your work or whatever. So you get a boost. It's like a temporary boost when you don't have uh, your, your people producing kids. But what happens eventually, those people retire and there's no one to replace them. And then you have a crash. So the Germans are facing quite a bad demographic situation. And they're not the only person in Europe or the new country in Europe that's facing that. It's a widespread European problem and to certain extent a widespread, you know, developed market problem. Uh, the exception is the U.S., but they import a lot of people. And that may be one of the reasons that they... You know, I'm not quite feeling it at the moment, but, you know, there's a lot of immigrants coming to the U.S. It's a very uh, big attractor of uh, foreigners. So that's an important factor to be considered. So looking at Europe, uh, we have this, obviously, issue coming about. And I think that if you just look forward a few years, uh, this is going to be a more and more important issue. And a startling thing from the Financial Times this week 
They're expecting in the next say, few decades, we talk about 2050, 2060, as many as half the countries in the world are going to be not investment grade, primarily due to the fact they have too many old people. Okay, think of it this way. The U.S. spends right now 40% of its budget, 40% of, of its budget, on people over the age of 65. That's only going to get higher. And you can't do much about this because people that are older tend to vote more. Look at what happened in France when they tried to raise the um, age of uh, retirement by two years to 62, 64. Massive rioting. People are going to fight for their benefits. But these economists can't afford these benefits because, you know, we don't, we don't have enough young people working there. Uh, you, you, there's a lot of talk about, oh, it's, it's the rich and so on. But understand, if you have, you know, half the budget of your country going to people over the age of 65, what's the other half going to the people under the age of 65? That, that's sort of a great way to go to the future. Uh, people over 65, uh, you know, bless them, but they are not going to be you know, more productive in the future. They're not going to add to GDP growth. They're not going to do all these things here. And you know, if you're going to spend that kind of money on the people that are old, you're going to have to tax the people that are young, make it more difficult for them to have children, and that's going to cause this problem to be more and more you know, problematic going into the future. Okay, And then our deep dive finally is into what's happened with the race decision this week as well as South Africa's inflation numbers. Uh, the Reserve Bank of South Africa raised the inflation, uh, sorry, the interest rate, uh, the repo rate basically by 50 basis points, half a percent. This is quite painful. Uh, I was just chatting to somebody today and saying that, you know, I just looked at what my bond was, and I bought it when it was close to the, the lowest interest rate we've had recently. And now, looking at just how much higher it is right now, you know, I've had almost like a 30% increase in my bond. It's, 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 it's quite high in terms of what the, 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 the increases in interest rates have done to me. And this is the same across the country. It's not just bonds and houses, it's home loans, it's businesses trying to basically um, you know, borrow money to start something new. Rising interest rates are quite painful, and the Reserve Bank has been very aggressive in doing so. That being said, I am a, a big fan of the Reserve Bank governor, uh, uh, Mr. Tlatla. I think it is a case where what he's doing is very painful, but he is doing the right thing. It has to be done in order to preserve the stability of the country. An example I would use as a counter example almost is Turkey, where they are not raising interest rates as the market expects in order to fight inflation, in order to do something about uh, the runaway weakness in their currency, etc. And they are experiencing, you know, almost a hundred percent inflation. You know, that's a huge, huge number. That economy is in dire, dire straits uh, in terms of the stability of their currency. And we in South Africa, to a certain extent, have been spared that. You look at some other places out there, you look at places like Argentina, you look at places like Ghana, places like Sri Lanka, etc. There will you know, be, I think, a situation going down the line where if we don't do something like this here, we'll join that group of countries. Now, in terms of the pain that we're going to be feeling initially, I think that is something that we basically do not, uh, you know, uh, call us, um, do not want to basically short change. Like I said, I've seen my, my bond go up dramatically. I've seen people in the country you know, suffering, etc. But understand that this is the right thing to do. Okay, I mentioned the inflation number. The inflation figure came out this week as well. Better than expected, you know. Uh, it's about 0.2% lower than expected. Uh, driven lower primarily by electricity and uh, fuel inflation, which are both lower. Uh, fuel inflation, you know, the oil price, the Brent crude price would approach like, you know, $70 a barrel. Uh, that obviously has to also be combined with the currency as well, which was like reasonably strong until a few weeks ago. And both those factors together helped us to drive you know, inflation down a little bit. But sadly, we are seeing food inflation remain stubbornly high. Uh, you know, close to about 14.5% for overall food inflation. Uh, you know, Splendid cereals, which is a staple, basically over 20%, 20.8%. Uh, we are seeing, you know, like milk, eggs and cheese, you know, up in like around uh, 15% or so, close to 14.5%. So these are reasonably high numbers, and why this is important is because in a country as poor as South Africa, we have a lot of people that depend, uh, or rather, a lot of people that spend a large chunk of their income on food. Now, if you double the price of food and you spend 1% of your income on food, it's 1% to 2%, not a big deal. You double the price of food and you spend basically 30% of your income on food, it goes from 30 to 60%, massive deal. You can see the difference. In a place like South Africa where people are quite poor, a large chunk of people are quite poor, what happens is when you have food price increases of 20% for staples, uh, you know, 14%, 15% overall, that translates into people not having enough food to feed their families. It's a, a really big deal. So yeah, that's, that's quite a depressing number. And look, again, in the short term, it's not going to be helped by the higher interest rate, but 
the Reserve Bank has to do something about the perceptions that we got right now about the weakening currency, uh, about the runaway inflation rate, because right now the currency is you know well above nineteen dollars, nineteen dollars a dollar. Uh, it's basically broken through that level and stayed above it ever since the U.S. ambassador came out and made that uh, little announcement about South Africa selling arms to the Russians. If he doesn't get this currency under control, the next couple of weeks, a couple months, sorry, this higher inflation, uh, no, weaker currency, sorry, the nineteen, maybe even twenty. Uh, rounds to the dollar you know, it's exchange rate is going to translate to higher inflation and it's going to make, make you have to increase interest rates even higher into the future. So having to do it now probably saves you some pain in the future. The next thing is if you can somehow break down and get this thing below 19 again, the currency market is very, very, you know, uh, trend driven. And that might be enough uh, on its own to actually get us to a point where we do see, uh, you know, um, back to maybe 18, maybe below 18, you know, it's possible, uh, you know, Obviously, barring the possibility of like a load shedding event or some other political scandal or, you know, maybe sanctions or whatnot. And that would make a huge impact in terms of inflation. You know, if the round was 17, the Reserve Bank would have a lot less to worry about as opposed to where it is right now. Okay. And so finally, we come to a deep dive on AI. And the big story this week is NVIDIA. NVIDIA came out with results, very good results. It seems to be that they are taking a really, really strong lead. Uh, in the AI space when it comes to providing the hardware. As someone phrased it, uh, NVIDIA is the people selling shovels in this gold rush. Uh, they're the people selling the, the, the equipment that's basically fueling the gold rush. Uh, and right now, they seem to be the only one that's doing really really well around it. Uh, to give an idea of how big it is, the increase in NVIDIA's value due to the earnings results, you know, as I'm talking right now, the, like this is just like a little into uh, the first day of trade after the results were released, is a bit bigger than the total value of Intel. That's just the increase in the last day. In, the increase in the value of NVIDIA in the last day is bigger than the, in, of Intel, which is gigantic. And it's, it's a huge, uh, you know, well-known company, as you all know. But it does show that we are looking at a lot of activity happening in this sector at the moment. And markets are not afraid to basically bet on winners. Uh, right now, it was, a, I think last day I checked, it was like a 28, 30% improvement in NVIDIA. Uh, in like aftermarkets because of the uh, situation with regards to uh, the earnings. For a company this size, 28, 30% improvement in prices, ridiculous. And like I said, the market is unafraid to bet on this. This is not a cautious market saying, oh, this is a power company, it's, you know, give us like a 5, 10% improvement. No, a third higher. Why? Because this, the, 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 the narrative around the AI is very strong. Those that are analyzing the sector, those that are looking into it, uh, are very convinced about the outcomes that are happening in here, or likely outcomes of the, of the technology. And this is the right time for me again to announce that look, we're having an, uh, a webinar next week on the 31st. Uh, go to our website, find more information about this. Uh, if not, uh, email uh, you know, Ranswiss, info at ranswiss.com uh, and find out more information about how to book your spot on this webinar. Uh, in it, I'll be covering what the technology uh, development is, why it is so important, what can be the impact in the future, and how you can invest in you know uh, what's happening in AI. And I, I quite frankly am quite convinced that this is uh, a technology at least as powerful as the internet, maybe as powerful as electricity. And that's something that's going to be having a huge impact in terms of your investments, not just in the next, say, few months or next year or two, but maybe for the next couple of decades. Just like the invention of the internet dominated uh, investments for basically 20 plus years. Companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, you know, Microsoft was older before that, but you know, Google, Amazon, uh, you know, Apple, uh, even just something like Microsoft because you know, it grew a lot because of the cloud, uh, the cloud business it has and so on. Uh, Facebook, some of the biggest companies in the world got the valuations due to the internet revolution. Okay? And so that is important to consider. So yeah, uh, join me next week and we'll discuss this further. Until then, have a good weekend and uh, look forward to seeing you guys next week. Cheers.